Welcome to the SatCord C2I analysis tutorial. In this tutorial I will show you how you can use SatCord to send data from an SNS database to a C2I analysis, how you can modify the victim and interferer data, and show some of the other options you have available to you with the C2I analysis. If you wish to understand how to use the individual C2I calculation tabs in SatCord you should view our C2I calculation tutorial. To send data from an SNS database to a C2I analysis, the first step is in opening the SNS database that contains the data you wish to send. For this example, I'm going to open the SOS by clicking on the Browse menu item and then selecting the SOS database. Next, you should browse to the data you wish to send to the C2I analysis. In this example, I'll perform a Notice Admin search and then choose the UK Administration and search for Notice Notification Reason, since I only want to send coordination request data and then search for Notice Satellite Name. I wish to send the data associated with the satellite network name AMSAT A4. To do this I need to select the corresponding output node and then click on the C2I Analysis icon in the toolbar. I wish to send this data to a new C2I Analysis tab and I want to send this data as the victim data. We can see that a new C2I Analysis tab has opened and that the AMSAT A4 data has been added to the victim data list. This list shows all of the individual notices to be included as victim data. SACCORD supports having as many notices as you wish, but bear in mind that the more data you add, the longer it will take to perform the analysis. Therefore, it is recommended that you carefully filter the data in the SNS Database Browsing tab before sending it to an Analysis tab. For example, if you only wish to perform an analysis on a specific frequency band, it makes sense to filter for that band before sending the data to a C2I analysis. Once the data has been sent to the Analysis tab, it is fully editable. I can click on the Notice, and on the right hand pane all of the relevant Notice level values are displayed. I can click in the relevant box for any of these to edit them. If I expand the Notice data, all of the beam data is included inside, and once again we can select any beam and the associated beam data is displayed on the right hand side. This data, including the diagram data, is fully editable. If we select the diagram data and then click on the button, it will open up an editor allowing us full control over the gain contour service area and gain towards the GSO diagrams associated with this beam. If I expand the beam data, all of the group data is included inside and we can select any group and the associated group data is displayed on the right hand side. Lastly, the group data can be expanded, which shows the frequency information, the emission information and the earth station information associated with that group. If we select any of these, then the associated data, once again fully editable, is displayed on the right hand side. For the purposes of this tutorial, I wish to keep the data the same as the file data and therefore I'm not going to make any changes at this time. The next step is to send the interferer data from our SNS database browsing tab. If I switch back to that tab, I wish to send the data associated with the satellite network name DFSAT120E. To do this, I need to select the corresponding output node and then click on the C2I analysis icon in the toolbar. I wish to send this to an existing C2I analysis tab, so I select the one I wish to send it to, and then I want to send this data as the interferer data. This will switch focus to the C2I analysis tab and we can see the interferer data has been populated with the DFSAT120E data. Once again, all of the beams, groups, frequencies, emissions and earth station data is shown here and is fully editable. Once we have finished adding our victim and interferer data, we should click on the results part of the analysis. We can at any point switch back to the input data and modify it if we wish, but from now on in the tutorial I will focus on the options available to us in the results part of the analysis. The results appear empty. In order to populate the results I need to click on the Run Analysis button. This will run a C2I analysis on our defined victim and interferer data. Once the analysis is run, a matrix of values is shown populated in accordance with the data view selected. The numbers that are displayed are by default the margin values calculated, and the default view is a beam name versus beam name view. Therefore, what we can see is a matrix of the worst case margin calculated for each combination of victim beam name versus interferer beam name. The victim beam names are displayed horizontally along the top, and the interferer beam names are displayed vertically down the side. We can see that for some beam combinations there are no results. This can be for a number of reasons, but is most likely due to there being no frequency overlap between the beams. The worst case value of margin is highlighted in red, and the best case value of margin is highlighted in green. At the bottom of the results is a list of errors, warnings and messages which have been generated during the analysis. For the case I have selected here there are no messages, but if there are any issues during the generation of the results then they will appear here. 
It is a good idea to study any messages as they generally refer to cases where specific data is missing which can result in certain analysis combinations being ignored. For example, if SACCORD could not find the gain console associated with a beam in GIMS because you have an old GIMS reference database that does not include a diagram for the network you are studying, it would be unable to perform the C2 analysis and an error would appear in this list. You could double click on a message to take you to the data that caused the issue in the input part of the analysis. There are a number of options available to you in the results part of the analysis. I've already used the run analysis button to initially populate the results matrix, but if you edit the input data you will need to press the run analysis button again in order to update the results to reflect the changes you made in your input data. Changing some of the other options, e.g. changing the data view, will also automatically rerun the analysis. The show error list button toggles whether the message list is visible or not. I would recommend leaving the message list visible to ensure you do not miss an issue with your analysis. The check conformity with the RR button toggles on and off with the only cases that have a favourable finding are included in the analysis. If you select the arrow on the right hand side of the button you can independently check or uncheck the victim and interferer data. By default these are checked so the unfavourable finding data is ignored. The use priority button toggles on or off whether regulatory priority is taken into account in the analysis. If priority is taken into account then only cases where the victim has priority over the interferer are taken into account. By default this is turned on. The next three icons denote uplink, downlink and bidirectional and allow you to toggle on or off the displaying of these cases. For example if you only wanted to see the uplink results you can toggle off the downlink and bidirectional cases. By default these are all toggled on. The next button, Switch Victim and Interferer, opens a new C2 analysis tab with the victim and interferer switched. This is useful if you wish to study the interference caused by a set of data as well as the interference received. If we press this button for this case, then a new C2 analysis tab opens, and if we look in the input data, you can see that the victim and interfere data have been switched. If we press the run analysis button, the results matrix remains empty, and this is because our interfere network has full priority over our victim network. If I toggle off the use priority button, then a results matrix will be displayed. Let me now close this tab and go back to the previous C2 analysis tab we had open, as there are still a few more options available to us. The results type option allows us to specify which type of result we want to see in the results matrix. By default the margin is shown, but we can alternatively see the C over I, the C0 over I0, the C over N plus I, the C0 over N0 plus I0, the I over N, or the I0 over N0. As we change the result type, the results matrix automatically updates to show that value and the heading changes to reflect the result type we have selected. Lastly, the Assumptions button lets us change the assumptions that are used for the analysis. For a C2 analysis, there are two assumptions that we can toggle. Take max bandwidth overlap only, and for margin, use worst case C2I earth station location. Regarding the first assumption, when performing a C2I analysis, results need to be calculated between every victim frequency assignment versus every interferer frequency assignment for a given victim group and interferer group where those frequency assignments overlap. We can significantly speed up this process by only performing the analysis on the frequency assignment pair which have the maximum overlap bandwidth. This will give a good approximation for the worst case, but will in most cases be very slightly less interfering than the true worst case. If you wish to toggle this assumption off you can do so and it will perform an analysis on every assignment combination. Regarding the second assumption, in order to significantly speed up the C2 analysis, SACCORD does a check on the input data to work out the worst case earth station locations before analysing the emission data. For the calculation of any of the result types with the exception of margin, this works well. However, with respect to the margin, the protection ratio, or the C2I required, depends on the emission data. Therefore, to do a full worst case margin analysis, every potential earth station location needs to be checked with respect to every emission, which significantly increases the combinations to be checked. In my opinion, it generally makes sense to actually analyse margin on the basis of finding the worst case C2I earth station location in any case, but you are able to check this assumption on or off to retrieve either result if you wish. Let me now talk a bit about the data view. The data view defines how the results are displayed. You can select a different data view or create your own. For example, we can change the view to a satellite name and beam name versus satellite name and beam name, but for this particular example that isn't very useful as we only have one satellite name as a victim and only one satellite name for an interferer. If you have multiple satellite names, this view is more useful. 
I can also change this to group ID versus group ID, which results in a larger results matrix. If we wish to understand the impact on a specific group, then this view lets us do that. Changing the view to service class versus service class displays the results matrix by service class information. This can be useful if you wish to only deal with a specific case. In this example, you may wish to ignore the TTNC data for the time being and focus on the FSS case, which are displayed separately here. We can easily see the worst case FSS versus FSS case has a margin of minus 6.41. The other two data views we can select are emission versus emission, which is useful if you wish to understand the impact on specific emission codes, or frequency band versus frequency band if you wish to do the analysis independently by frequency band. In our case we only have one frequency band so this is just showing us the worst overall margin for all cases. You are able to define your own data views by clicking on the edit button at the end of the data view selection drop down. The last thing I want to show you in this tutorial is that you can open up a calculation tab for any of the results in the results matrix by double clicking on them. For example, if I double click on the worst identified case here of minus 6.59, it will open up a C to I calculation in the uplink, as it so happened that this particular result was due to a calculation in the uplink. The options available to you in the calculation tab are covered in the help file and in the separate C to I calculation tutorial, but I just want to say in this tutorial that you can see the specific victim data, the specific interferer data in the top left corner that corresponds to the result we saw in our results matrix. You can see the results calculation in the bottom left corner, including a margin value of minus 6.59. A beam plot shows the relevant gain contour and service area diagrams, and a frequency plot shows the exact assignments that have been used in the calculation of this case. This data is all fully editable, including all of the victim and interferer data, as well as the gain contour and service area data, and is cloned from our analysis calculation, so changes to the data in this tab will not impact the data in the analysis tab. This tab is for trying to understand where the issue has come from and how to solve the issue in detail. Now if I close this tab and double click on the value of minus 6.3, a CTOI calculation in the downlink is opened instead. This is very similar to the uplink calculation tab but instead showing the data relevant to a downlink calculation. Once again this data is all fully editable and will not impact on the data in our analysis tab. For more information on the C2I calculation tabs, please view our C2I calculation tutorial. A link is provided in the description below this video. As of version 2.3 of SACCORD, some new features were added into the C2I analysis that I would like to take you through. Firstly, the results grid has been changed to indicate the analysis type, uplink, downlink or bidirectional, in each cell, and the colouring has been changed so that green text indicates a pass and red text indicates a fail. The pass value can be specified manually through the use of the pass value toolbar item. The cell background shaded red is the worst case fail and the cell shaded green is the best case pass. The next new feature is that when defining the input data associated with an analysis, certain numerical fields can be input as a formula. Fields which support this are marked with an asterisk. For example, in the emission data, the power and PSD fields can be input this way. Let me reduce the maximum power by 10 dB through the use of a formula. This also automatically changes the maximum PSD. You can turn off locking the power and PSD by clicking on this toolbar item. For this example it is on, so every time I change either the power or PSD, the other changes by the same amount to keep the ratio constant. Maths formulas support many operators and functions, including trigonometric or logarithmic functions. Let me now change the maximum power to a value using the maximum PSD and the necessary bandwidth. You can also reset the value back to its default value by right clicking on the header and choosing reset. Next let me explain the key new feature, filters and constraints. First I will talk about filters. Filters allow you to restrict the data which is sent to the analysis. This is the benefit of allowing you to focus on one key aspect of the analysis and also significantly speeds up the analysis. As an example of this, let us assume we only want to examine a small piece of the frequency band which has been filed, just the 12.2 to 12.5 GHz band. We can set up a filter to only include data from this range by clicking on the Filter Constraints tab and then adding a filter. Inside the filter dialog we want the filter to apply to both the victim and interferer and the filter to be applied as a frequency range filter where the frequency range is equal to 12.2 to 12.5 GHz. We can now click on OK and name the filter. 
The checkbox allows you to toggle filters on or off. As this is checked, it is toggled on. Next, we need to go back to our results tab and then rerun the analysis to apply the filter. As you can see, the results have been updated so that now, as expected, we only see the downlink results since the 12.2 to 12.5 GHz band is a downlink band. Now if we select an individual calculation, you can see that the frequency ranges included in the analysis are only those that overlap with the specified 12.2 to 12.5 GHz band. You can add a number of different filters including filtering by notice data, beam data, group data, emission data, associated earth station data or frequency data. You can also apply filters to only the victim, to only the interferer or to both. Now I want to talk about constraints. The constraints part of the tab allows us to specify limits or restrictions on our data in order to try to solve potential coordination issues. These constraints take the form of the most common limits used during coordination meetings, such as downlink interferer EIRP or EIRP density limits, uplink interferer max off-axis EIRP or EIRP density limits, or many others. For this example, let me add a new downlink EIRP density limit by clicking on the add icon in the associated toolbar and then selecting that limit from the list. In the dialog that opens, I want to specify the limit as an EIRP density limit and I'm going to specify the value of minus 25 dBW per hertz. You can also scope the constraint to just a specific part of our data, but since we've already filtered our analysis to just the 12.2 to 12.5 GHz band range, I will not specify a scope as I want it to apply to everything in this range. Note that downlink constraints are automatically only scoped to downlink analysis. Next, I click on the OK button and then give the constraint a name. Just as with the filters, the final step is to go to the results tab and then press on the run analysis button to rerun the analysis taking into account our constraint. As you can see, this has now solved all of the coordination issues in the 12.2 to 12.5 GHz band. We can double click on one of these to see the detailed calculation as before. The detailed calculation takes into account the constraints and more information is provided on this in the C2I calculation tutorial. Let me now go back to the constraints part of the analysis. There are available a number of different constraints, some apply in the downlink, some in the uplink and some with respect to bidirectional analysis and some to all three. Through the use of constraints you can solve complex coordination issues and easily understand the impact on the analysis of a specific coordination limitation. Thank you for watching, this ends the C2I analysis tutorial. If you have any questions please contact us using the information in the description below.